It is my distinct privilege to deliver brief remarks at this National Health Symposium, which will see us reflecting on health in Guyana over the past 50 years. I wish to take this opportunity to thank PAHO WHO for partnering with the Ministry of Public Health to host several activities to celebrate Health at 50 in Guyana. The wealth of a nation is its people's health. And as we prepare to celebrate Guyana's golden jubilee of independence, it is an opportunity, opportune time for us to reflect on the progressive journey of the health sector over the past 50 years. We have gathered here today to reflect on the health situation in Guyana over the last decades, review the current health situation, and to make forward projections. Over the past 50 years, Guyana's health system has passed through many stages. In an effort to avoid preempting the presentations which will be made later today, I will not delve into specifics. In the early independence era, food and nutrition was a major focus in the public health sector in order to address malnutrition challenges. Also in the early days of independence, the Ministry of Health focused on addressing sanitary matters. A culture of unhygienic practices allowed many diseases, especially those which are vector-borne, to thrive. This issue still persists to some extent today. The accomplishments in the health sector over the past 50 years are many. Guyana's ability to increase its life expectancy is one such accomplishment. Life expectancy has risen from 40 in the 1960s to 61 by 1970, and that remained the same by the 1990s. This has now increased to 64 for males and 71 for females, as per 2014 statistics. And this was made possible due to improvements in healthcare delivery. Another remarkable achievement of the Ministry of Public Health is the mastering of the immunization process. The ministry boasts the best immunization program in the region, with a vaccination coverage of over 90% for all antigens for the under five population. This is in spite of our geographical situation. However, we have not become complacent, and every year the expanded program on immunization receive millions of dollars for the purchasing of vaccines, equipment and services to ensure the safe delivery of the vaccination process. Over the past 50 years, we have seen the building of new and the modernization and upgrading of previously existing hospitals and health facilities. The training of medical professionals, especially in the postgraduate sector. Our focus has now shifted to issues such as mental health, chronic disease, emerging infectious disease, such as the H1N1 virus, the Zika virus, and of course the chikungunya, and HIV and AIDS. These issues, among others, are being tackled head on using robust strategies and an action plan, chief among them being the Health Vision 2. 2020. The vision is to place all Guyanese, all people of Guyana, among the healthiest in the Caribbean and the Americas by the year 2020. The government of Guyana is fully committed to building a resilient healthcare system in which Guyanese are provided with health services, which are as accessible, acceptable, affordable, timely, and appropriate as possible. We are also fully committed to working towards reaching the sustainable development goals as we lay the foundation for a new development agenda. Our health sector over the years have been filled with many challenges, but also with many successes. In our duty to work together to ensure that current and, and future generations are afforded the opportunity 
to experience a health sector in which the success by far outweighs the challenges are being undertaken. We as a government cannot develop the health sector on our own, and I therefore take this opportunity to recognize the efforts of PAHO WHO and other developing development partners over the years. PAHO WHO in particular has been instrumental in developing the health system with their invaluable technical and other support. The government of Guyana is eternally grateful and looks forward to working with you, PAHO WHO, over the next 50 years and beyond. Everyone has a role to play in the development of the public health system in Guyana. Let us all work together to ensure that Guyanese are among the healthiest in the Caribbean and the Americas. Thank you very much. Today is an important day because I cannot recall in my life as a journalist which spanned many, many years that I have been invited to a national health symposium. It shows that there is a recognition that health is a matter for all of our people, not only those involved in the health sector. And I wish to share the words of gratitude expressed by Minister Norton for the efforts of PAHO WHO over many, many years and through difficult times in bringing relief to what has been a distressed health system and health sector in Guyana. As you know, you have a very packed program today. I have seen a reflection on what happened in the past, a reflection and analysis of what happens today, and then you have health in the future. But as, even as your agenda is packed, I see it, also, it is also very rewarding. You would have lunch. <laughs> Unfortunately, they have to leave for some other engagements and would not partake of the incentive for being here. You know that I have seldom read speeches at public fora. It's not my nature. But I could get away with political rhetorics. But I'm not sure I'm lucky to get away with medical prognostication. So you'll forgive me if I read my presentation. I was born and lived at a time, I still do, before independence, when health was both a matter of medicine and miracle. I suppose after 50 years of independence, our people still rely, though less so today, on the Bush doctor who would beat out or as we say in quarantine, jare, illnesses, which I refer to in my book, Henry's Cure. The cynics will look back at the past and they would remember one such notorious Bush doctors in the person of Jim Jones, self-proclaimed Reverend Jim Jones, who miraculously but falsely had rendered instant cure for cancer and all maladies. In that period, the inadequacy of our health system and lack of confidence in it had made these other deceptive cures attractive. That was so then, and to a great extent today, due to a lack of funding for public health and the unavailability of qualified medical personnel, including specialists. What is remarkable, though, is that while Guyana has a mix of public and private health care, our people benefit from a system of free 
care from the time of our independence to today. This is remarkable. We all know that Guyana's public health system was initially set up to service the dominant foreign-owned economic activities in the then colony of British Guyana. That plantation-type healthcare system was geared towards ensuring that workers and staff who were associated with the sugar and bauxite industries had better access to health services. Primary health care was almost unknown in the interior and riverine areas where our people were wasted by all types of diseases such as malaria and tuberculosis. That had begun to change during the immediate pre-independence period under the then limited government when rural, riverine, and hinterland health services became a primary responsibility of the state. It will be remiss of me not to say that a great innovator of rural health services was the late Mrs. Janet Jagan, a health minister before independence, who later became one of Guyana's head of state. After independence, especially since 1980, the decentralization of health care was institutionalized. That came about with the formation of the 10 administrative regions. The system was also changed to recognize as a fundamental right primary health care. The Regional Democratic Council was responsible for delivery of health services in its respective region, with the Ministry of Health, now the Ministry of Public Health, providing policy guidance technical and financial support, and monitoring of the health outcomes. The Ministry of Health was responsible for policy formulation, standard setting, and monitoring of service delivery by both the public and private sectors, and the formation of at least two regional health authorities that would be responsible for service delivery. One was dysfunctional. The other is still a, a part of the system, though also in some level of, of uh, non-delivery. I believe the debate before cabinet right now is to be able to have these regional health authorities reinstated in the regions. And that is a matter that is currently before the cabinet with very strong advocacy by Minister of Public Health, Dr. Norton, for it, of course, supported by Dr. Abu Crow, who had addressed the cabinet recently. In all that happened and could have been possible, state financial allocation was the major hurdle. It must be recognized though that all governments since independence had laid emphasis on universal health care and planned spending within affordable levels of the state budget. We might say that the health budgets were never enough or adequate, but were justified on an argument that for the greater part after independence, Guyana had remained marginally poor. Only more recently, we styled ourselves as a low-middle-income country, which is like saying that we are poor, but not miserably poor. Our annual GDP, GDP per capita income floats at 3,700 US dollars as compared to smaller Caribbean islands, except Haiti, where average incomes were two, three, and four times more than ours. So it must be recognized, therefore, that health had to compete with all the sectors for state allocation of what essentially have been scarce financial resources. 
Yes, the allocation from the budget for health increased from 5.1% in 2008 to 9.5% in 2016. And this year, it increased marginally. In other words, it is, it is climbing, though incrementally and though in small, by small percentages. These amounts will never be enough since demands continue to be made for greater spending to meet changes in disease profile that we experience periodically. This is what the statistics shows. In the early 1980s, infectious diseases such as malaria, dengue fever, typhoid fever, and gastroenteritis provided the greatest disease burden in the health sector. In 2004, there was a decline in malaria cases, which averaged around 25,000 cases, but increased to an annual average of about 30,000 until 2014, when there was a 63% reduction in cases to some 2,600. In 2006, there was a peak in reports of HIV AIDS cases, and the Secretariat benefited from an unprecedented inflow of funds. I tried to dabble in the health sector, and this is an area I'm interested in, to know how much came in actually from humanitarian international agencies to help us fight our HIV AIDS problems. There, there have been controversies over the credibility of information and on actual cases. But the 2010-2015 figures disclose an annual average of 1,035 cases. All the figures show that tuberculosis continued to increase annually and reach its maximum in 2012 with 725 new cases. And thereafter, there was a progressive reduction in the number of cases which reached 512 in 2015. The new interventions of the directly observed treatment short course, DOTS, and vaccination of our children are some of the interventions which have led to the decrease in the number of tuberculosis cases. With the government's ability to improve water, sanitation, and housing conditions, the prevalence of these diseases has been reduced considerably. The country has also, some recent, also have some recent challenges with vector bone viruses such as chikungunya and Zika, which in spite of false prophecy have not attained epidemic proportions. You remember recently when we had the 2016 budget, we were warned that the Zika virus in Guyana had reached epidemic proportions. I am informed that Zika has been restricted to six certified cases, subject always to corrections from the medicos, though the threat still remains and would require an intensification of the campaign to rid our communities of the mosquitoes that transmit the virus. As regards Zika, I applaud the position of Public Health Minister Dr. George Norton and Minister Dr. Karen Cummins to tackle the spread of this virus. Every week, Dr. Norton would report to the Cabinet on the virus situation, and every week, he would report on what measures have been taken countrywide, including fogging, to restrict the flow of the disease-borne bearing mosquitoes. And we in the government hope that we can fight this threat with unyielding resolve. However, however, we wish to warn that equally passionate is the pharmaceutical industry. I recall when the H1N1 first news of it broke, the shadows of it 
perhaps hovered over Guyana. There was a massive lobby by the pharmaceutical industry that we needed billions of dollars of medical supplies to prepare for what could be a pandemic outbreak of H1N1 in Guyana. And so, when I use the word warn, I use that word not guardedly. I use that as an indictment. That today again, we are told that we have an acute shortage of drugs in all the regions. And again, when we had Zika, the lobby came shouting that we have the drugs. We have the drugs. You need it, and you need it in large quantities. So that sometimes you have a distorted image of what really the health situation is or what health threat is, depending on who shouts first and who shouts loudest. And not only do they have the capacity to shout louder, they are like that snake or dragon with many heads and many mouths. And they shout through many mouths, even uh, through the mouths of friends of the government. And so they, this lobby has placed tremendous pressures on our limited financial resources to sole source, not through open bidding, to sole source drugs and medical supplies for every ailment, whether real or perceived. The need for an inventory of purchase of medical supplies over the last decade is outstanding since we ought to learn how to spread these limited resources and not just respond to the insatiable appetite of the suppliers. For us, we can say with confidence that our coalition government will continue to allocate the resources necessary to alleviate all of the health problems that continue to affect our population. Regarding specialists to address specific health conditions, the country continues to experience challenges with the availability or non-availability of skilled human resources. The brain drain has taken away many of our trained and capable nurses and midwives, as well as doctors and dentists and other high-level personnel in the medical sector. Many others fell victim to attrition due to poor wages and incentives. We need time to repair this broken system of neglect of and ingratitude towards the people who have delivered us and who have kept us reasonably safe over these 50 years and more. To alleviate these staff challenges, Guyana is currently training local doctors in the fields of obstetrics, pediatrics, surgery, and medicine. The government of Guyana is also investing in the health sector through the conduct of various capacity building programs for doctors and nurses at the primary health care level and for personnel who must work away from the coastline. We stand proud today and salute our frontline health workers in the interior and remote areas who have played critical roles in the development of the health sector. I salute you in the name of our government. Over the 50-year period of our independence, Guyana undertook several cycles in the immunization program, where we have moved from 47% coverage around the 1970s to over 90% of all antigens given to children under one year at the end of 2015. Coupled with this is the reduction in the level of anema for our pregnant mothers and children through numerous nutritional interventions. <coughs> Esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, Today, our challenge is to improve maternal health and reduce maternal mortality. It remains disgraceful and uncaring to have two mothers in a bed, or even a single mother 
on the floor of any hospital. It bring back, brings back the imagery of the dreadful past, where in isolated cases, patients were bitten by rats and our major public hospitals were deemed death traps. Guyana has crafted a Millennium Development Goal Accelerated Framework to improve maternal health, which will address the proposed solutions in order to meet the Sustainable Development Goals of 2030. Already, the expansion of, of maternal health care facilities is on the way, and we hope that this issue of inadequate accommodation for mothers who visit our hospital would be a thing of the past. We are all obsessed in the cabinet when we read every case of maternal death, every case of pregnant mothers having to share beds. It is a high objective on our agenda. Mental health issues, including suicide, continue to pose major, if not sensational, challenges. And I'm encouraged by the sincere concerns shown from all sections of our community and the humanitarian help being given by overseas voluntary organizations to fight these complex social diseases. We have to work together, not only for better health service delivery, but to realize a clean environment and a green economy. We have to teach our children healthy lifestyles and to make sure that eventually all children in school get not only buses and boats and boots and books, they are entitled to a healthy, hot meal to make them strong and to be able to be more receptive to educational values. Our need for partnership today is greater than ever before. We need to pay more attention to preventative medicine, to curb the use of and addiction to illicit drugs, to discourage alcohol abuse, to regulate advertising and promotion of tobacco smoking, to make such administrative and other measures to guarantee that food manufacturers, suppliers, and food handlers comply with safety and health standards. And last but not least, to remove garbage from our streets, our markets, our communities, to ensure that a good life includes a clean environment. Our health workers, tutors, managers, and policy makers have been the backbone of our achievements and challenges. We salute you today for the tremendous work that you have done in moving the health sector forward. Let us today, together on this historical occasion, though today is the 13th and it's Friday. <laughs> you all frightened? <laughs> the best way to beat fear is togetherness. So let us together today reflect from where we have come. And where we have come from, as I told you in my own lucid, open and frank style, is mostly not something we are proud of. We could have done better. We neglected our health system. And so we have to deal with reality, but we have to also move on. We have to take stock of where we are today and where we'd like to be in the future, which is what you have as your themes on your agenda. Our responsibility still remains great. Let us take courage from our motto, your motto, every Guyanese citizen must live a productive and healthy life. I thank the sponsors and organizers of this activity, which provides the opportunity to highlight all of our achievements, our challenges, and our future goals. I thank you for listening to my presentation.